served in the family court bench for almost a decade. He has been involved in numerous committees and projects for the purpose of improving the courts. He serves as a settlement judge for cases assigned to other judges so parties can resolve their disputes with a minimum of time, stress, and money. Prior to becoming a judge, he was in private practice for many years, in addition to serving as Clark County's first truancy master. I'd like to give a warm welcome to Judge Bill Henderson. Thank you very much for that introduction. Hi, I was wondering who you were talking about. I said, <laughs> I want to meet that judge. Uh, it's so I'm nice not even, to have you on my show. So not a lot of people know that you are my cousin-in-law. That's right. Yeah, you're married to my, my first cousin. And that's cousin, why I'm going to get yeah. just softball questions here instead of any real challenge. <laughs> and he's been a good friend of mine for over 10 years. Oh, a long right? time. long yeah. time. So, Bill. I want to ask you, this is very important, you are also the only judge to be a full sponsor of the annual Pro Bono Awards luncheon. So tell us a little bit about that. I'm so glad you asked that, because that's been a pet peeve of mine. Because for years, I've seen these cases where one side has an attorney mm -hmm. and the other side doesn't. And the side with the attorney has a tremendous advantage because the attorneys know all the rules. They know how to present the case. Mm -hmm. Now, why does the one person have an attorney and the other doesn't? Well, naturally, in most cases, because one they don't side have can't money. afford, they don't right. have the money. Mm -hmm. They go to see an attorney, and the mm -hmm. attorney says it's going to be three, four, five hundred dollars an hour, and it may take dozens of hours to handle the case, mm -hmm. and the person's making fifteen dollars an hour, eighteen dollars an hour. So it's impossible. Mm -hmm. So what I'm committed to, and I think what a, a lot of the judges in legal community are involved in now and committed to, is this pro bono project in order to get people assigned attorneys free of charge. Mm -hmm. And I've gotten involved in a way that's beyond what we usually do from a judicial perspective. Usually judges are good at promoting it, at trying to convince attorneys to accept pro bono cases and to work those cases mm -hmm. for free. Mm -hmm. And I'm involved in that aspect mm -hmm. as well. But that's I decided amazing. more needs to be done and I actually need to financially commit to this so that there's more money in the pot so that more people can be provided attorneys mm -hmm. free of mm -hmm. charge. So let's start with something that I read about lately which really concerns me. I learned that over 60% of current litigants in family court are unrepresented. Uh, presumably because like what you exactly. said they don't have money yes. and they can afford it and they can afford to have an attorney so uh, can you elaborate more on that what special challenges are there um, in dealing with unrepresented litigants and that's a really good point because the problem with unrepresented litigants is they think it's like it is on television they can just come in and tell their story and it's a David versus Goliath type thing and that the truth comes out mm -hmm. because even though the one side has the high powered attorney mm -hmm. the downtrodden party the truth is going to come out and they're going to present it and everything's going to be okay unfortunately that's the fairy tales of mm -hmm. fiction of movies and books mm -hmm. the fact of the matter is though in actuality even though we're all committed to be as fair as possible, and we are to the people unrepresented, that doesn't mean the side with an attorney tells their story and the unrepresented person stands up and tells theirs. Mm -hmm. It's not that simple. Mm -hmm. The party that has an attorney controls the dialogue, the flow of information. Mm -hmm. They can use all these objections and rules mm -hmm. in order to prevent that person from bringing up certain information or from presenting certain documents. That's why it's so critical to have an attorney, and he must do so at that first hearing, because mm -hmm. it sets the stage for the whole case. Mm -hmm. The damage that occurs at that first hearing often is not undone. Mm -hmm. So the advice is always, always go to court with an attorney. With always. A Anytime it's a contested right. case, mm -hmm. unless it's something simple mm -hmm. and uncontested mm -hmm. and both parties mm -hmm. came to an agreement, mm -hmm. I could understand mm -hmm. why they may want to save mm -hmm. the money. Although even then, it's good to have an attorney review mm -hmm. the agreement. Mm -hmm. but Anytime something is at stake, mm -hmm. nothing is more important to people than their children and their everything they've worked hard for to acquire over the years. Mm -hmm. Why would you risk going into that alone? I mean, people don't perform surgery on themselves or don't perform their own root canals, but right. for some reason, people think they can go into court mm -hmm. and deal with these issues about their property and their children, mm -hmm. and the children are the most important things that can happen to them. And no one would think again of doing their own dentistry work, mm -hmm. yet your children are far more important to someone than the current condition of their teeth. So by all means, you need to have an attorney at every step in the 
custody process where someone's saying things about you that are untrue, you need to be able to fight back and to present your position. Right. So um, following up on, um, and there was some reference um, to this issue during the introduction, what can be done to secure attorney, attorney for family court litigants who can't afford attorneys? And that's exactly what this project is ge geared to, mm -hmm. is this pro bono project. They can call Nevada Legal Aid Society. Mm -hmm. They can call pro bono. And the idea is to get more attorneys into this pool because it can be a little confusing because some attorneys work directly for the agencies and are paid. And they accept the people like Legal Aid Society if people uh, satisfy a certain financial requirement, they'll accept them. But they have to reject so many people. Mm -hmm. So the project that I and these others are involved in and other judges, we're all trying to promote this so that private attorneys accept a lot of these overflow cases. And I commend all the judges who were involved in that, and it seems most, if not all, of them are. And again, I wanted to go an extra step and actually put some money into that pot so that these lawyers could be paid to represent these people. That's so fantastic. The, it's mm -hmm. free to the people, mm -hmm. but the lawyers still eventually have to be paid because we want them to have the inducement to accept the cases and do their best job. So mm -hmm. they have to be paid, mm -hmm. and it comes out of this pot. So that's the goal of it all. That's wonderful, Bill, that you do that. Oh, now, thank you. Thank as you. a community leader and someone involved in so many organizations, I've been approached over the years with people complaining about their lawyers, such as I can't do the work or they're being overcharged. Okay, so the lawyer's overcharging the clients. How can someone know if their lawyer is working hard in their best interest? Oh boy, that happens all the time. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's just a lack of information. Sometimes the things seem overwhelming or people think their lawyer sold them out when really the lawyer came to the best agreement they could under the circumstances and it was the parties that had unrealistic expectations. Mm -hmm. So, but sometimes lawyers actually are overcharging for unnecessary yes, work and, and not acting in the best interest that. of mm -hmm. their clients. Mm -hmm. I think the majority of the times when we hear these complaints, probably the large majority, probably would just the people are just suffering from a lack of information and the lawyers need to communicate better with the mm -hmm. clients about the process, what it entails, mm -hmm. what we'll be successful at, what aspects we may have trouble with, how much is the whole process going to cost. Mm -hmm. But with that being said, there are some cases where lawyers are charging people an enormous amount of money, sometimes unnecessary money, and not a lot is happening. Mm -hmm. Now, before someone runs to the state bar and reports the lawyer for that, because the state the bar doesn't want to deal with a lot of unnecessary complaints, mm -hmm. and you hate to see lawyers who are otherwise doing a good job and have a good career dealing with a lot of unnecessary complaints. Mm -hmm. So I think what might be a good idea is whenever possible, have another lawyer review it go to another family law specialist or someone who at least practices in the area and say, here's what's going on, I'm dissatisfied and or I'm not getting my questions answered. What do you think of the approach and strategy taken by the attorney? Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's, it's just like medicine, getting a second opinion. Second opinion. And sometimes so it really goes important. a long way. Okay. So that, it really is important to get a second opinion. Don't just I think it is. Question. I think it's, right, mm -hmm. particularly when mm -hmm. you're choosing, a, if selecting a lawyer, get three or four opinions. Mm -hmm. Once you select one, as long as you're satisfied with the lawyer, you don't need to mm -hmm. be running out having mm -hmm. someone you know, second guess it. But if you're really dissatisfied or have a lot of questions, make an appointment with another yeah, You know, I also I've, have known you for so long, and I know that in the past, when you were an attorney, you've taken cases uh, not having, I mean, not taking money from, from the clients just to help them out. So um, let's talk about children born outside marriage. And that's why a lot mm -hmm. of lawyers, unfortunately, were more successful than me. And I, I think there were a lot of lawyers like me who didn't earn as much as others who were maybe better than some lawyers that were earning a lot. And that phenomenon is still going on today. Mm -hmm. You can't necessarily judge the best lawyers by how much they're earning. Mm -hmm. Some of the best advocates who come into my court are soft-hearted uh -huh. for a hard luck story or yes. something like that, and they're just not charging what they should. I agree, and and you were you were one of those. I appreciate and, that. And um, so many others who are out yeah, there doing the same. Yes, I, I completely agree. Now, um, what are the main misconceptions uh, parties have about legal process in family court? Because there's a lot of misconceptions out there. I think one of the main ones, mm -hmm. and we just hit on that with the a person unrepresented, where people think that the truth will come out or that it's pretty easy to demonstrate, and if the other side is lying, it should be pretty obvious that I can make the truth come out. 
And the fact of the matter is, again, it's only that way in fiction. In real life, the judge wasn't a fly on the wall at your house. He doesn't know, what he, he or she doesn't know what was going on. So it's not enough to just present something and have some lawyer object and say you shouldn't be allowed to present it. So first you need to even the playing field and have a lawyer so that you know that you can at least bring forth what you perceive as being the truth. Mm -hmm. That's number one. And a second misconception or thing, a matter that they're not aware of is how much it's going to cost. They know what the attorney charges as a retainer. But I think they're generally entitled to better answers than they receive when they say, how much is this all going to cost me? And the lawyer says, I, I don't know. It depends how much the other side fights or what lawyer they handle or hire. And that's all very true. But with that being said, I think most lawyers can give a ballpark based on who the other side has and who the judge is and what the issues are that are being contested. They should be able to give people a general idea as to whether this is a case that's going to cost 5,000, 10, 15, 20,000, 50, or 100. Mm -hmm. And when we're talking about 50 or 100,000, mm -hmm. those are the cases where only people earning a few hundreds, hundreds of thousands a year right. can afford. Right. And yet there are some lawyers mm -hmm. who will take a retainer and they know it's going to cost 100,000 to get to trial. And it raises the question should have they accepted it when the person only earns 48,000 a year mm -hmm. and the lawyer will then have to withdraw? his or her services before trial and leave the person, mm -hmm. when the person's not able to mm -hmm. pay for it, and leave the person representing themselves. Mm -hmm. So a, a misconception, or at least an area where there needs to be much more clarity, is how much may this whole process cost? Mm -hmm. And if they know that in advance, they can pick their fights carefully about what issues they should come to an agreement on and resolve, mm -hmm. and which ones they should fight. Some a third I mean, misconception is just how long everything takes. You right. see, it, as again, in the half hour, or one hour television program, they, in the one hour drama, they have to have that whole matter resolved in an hour or 48 minutes if you count right. commercials. In real life, these things have a carbon half-life. They mm -hmm. go on and on and on. And some, and, you know. some, some lawyers are also, um, uh, they're not honest uh, to their clients. They would say, oh, you're going to win, or they, they don't, as, as long as they get the money. I think that's another problem, mm -hmm. is you need to cli give uh, your client realistic expectations. I'm glad you brought that up, because that's another uh, common misconception or problem. So we could add that to the list as a, a right. fourth major mm -hmm. issue, is that lawyers, to get, it's tough for lawyers, because to get the client and to get them to sign up, a lawyer has to straddle that fine line. They have to be conf confident enough to instill in the client a feeling of security. This lawyer is going to be fighting for me and to get results that are that I need and that I desire. Mm -hmm. So they, but yet on the so uh, yet if the lawyer goes too far with that, you'll have a disenchanted client when he doesn't he or she doesn't deliver those expectations. And yet if you undersell the case, like you say, I'm going to be too honest because I have to be real careful with this person. They may take it to the person down the block, who the, uh, some blowhard down the block who tells them anything they want to hear, even if the lawyer knows he or she can't deliver on that, just to get that $10,000 right. retainer. So, so I guess the lesson to all this is people just have to be, become a really trained, informed consumer before they buy, uh, hire a lawyer. And mm -hmm. usually you're hiring one at the so last minute. How, they need how, to bunker down and do right, their homework. So how, how, what can be done to help eliminate those misconceptions and provide people with more realistic expectations? I think availing themselves anytime that you see lawyers offering free seminars in public on mm -hmm. the family law, people go to, should go to those. Sometimes they only go when they're in the middle of litigation, but if you feel you or a, pro, a loved one or a family member may be encountering that situation a year from now, those are cropping up all over the place. And I think maybe they're motivated so the lawyers can try mm -hmm. and get mm -hmm. some business. But nevertheless, keep, they should keep, there's a lot of valuable information. They should keep their eyes out for lawyers presenting free seminars in family law. They should keep their eyes out for, like UNLV and community college, have these courses where these pro bono type courses or legal service lectures or seminars mm -hmm. where they teach people who are representing themselves how to represent themselves if they're forced to or provide sources of if you're able to afford a lawyer of a reasonable mm -hmm. price range, right. here's where you can go, just yeah. to keep their eyes out open and yeah. to contact the mm -hmm. legal aid center, see if mm -hmm. they qualify for mm -hmm. a lawyer, because information is knowledge. You know? Absolutely. Now, uh, this is very informative, Bill, and I think everybody need to know this. So. Um, and people need to know that he also sings. He's a singing judge. But I won't yeah. sing right here now. 
Because I don't want the, I, I don't want the people running for their earplugs or the, re, the remote control. So we'll save that for another episode. Well, thank you so much thank for being for here today. Me. I'm so happy you could make it. That I'm was very informative, and I hope the viewers enjoyed that. And I would love to have you back. I'd be delighted to return. Thank you so, much, so much, Bill. Thank you, Judge Henderson.